Welcome, everyone. We have hit the magic time to start our webinar. Um, and this is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And I want to welcome you to our first fall webinar of 2018 on collaborative platforms for open content development. And I'm pleased to say we have uh, two very exciting projects um, and the leaders <laughs> here who are going to share with you. All right, let me just get my slides started here. Okay. Um, so our agenda is um, I'm going to introduce our speakers in just a moment and uh, then we're going to have a very quick overview of CCCOER and I want to welcome our brand new members to the consortium and then we're going to hear from two projects. We're going to hear from the Massachusetts Go Open OER Hub and then we're going to hear from the early childhood education discipline groups and then we have a few uh, um, news items at the end about what's coming up and how to stay involved in our community. So I want to welcome everybody again uh, who's joining us today and invite you to share uh, your information in the chat window. Um, you should be able to see the chat window um, uh, under the more button or up at, in your toolbar and um, share with us, um, if you will, who you are, what institution you're from and uh, any OER interest you might have. And now I'm going to turn to our speakers here and ask them to give us a very quick uh, hello and uh, whatever they'd like to share with us very quickly uh, before we dive into the main part of our webinar. So first up is Donna Maturi. She's the coordinator of library services at Middlesex Community College. Good afternoon, everyone. So I've been at Middlesex for um, about four years now and involved in OER for the last three. We're working very hard to get our OER initiative up and running and expanding. And it's been wonderful working with our statewide partners, which we'll be telling you a little bit about in our presentation. Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Shea. I'm Donna's colleague at Middlesex Community College in Massachusetts. I'm the Director of Professional Development here. Uh, I am by training uh, an instructor and an instructional designer. And my area of particular interest with regards to OER has been interactive open educational use. Great, thank you, thank you, Donna and Peter. And of course, uh, the, they're they're at Middlesex College, which is one of the fifteen colleges in the Massachusetts Go Open um, project, and which has been doing amazing things for the last few years. All right, next I want to turn to um, Amanda Tainter, who is an early childhood education faculty at Reedley College. She's also the OER coordinator there. Mm -hmm. uh, my official title is uh, Faculty Coordinator of Instructional Design and Distance Education. I, I come from child development and still am able to teach uh, child development courses. Uh, we've been working towards um, developing and utilizing OER on our campus for about two years now, and our child development department has been leading that um, charge. Thank you, Amanda, and we'll make sure we correct that before we post the slides. I apologize for that. Um, and next up is Jennifer Paris, who is also an early childhood education faculty member, but at College of the Canyons, and she's also leading uh, a ZTZ degree program at her college in the same area, just as Amanda is. Jennifer? Hi, everybody. Yeah, um, I, um, I don't have a fancy title. Um, I am in my fourth semester, so I, I guess my official title would be assistant professor. Um, but yes, we're uh, I'm, I'm super excited to be here at College of the Canyons and really trying to leverage the interests nationwide on creating OER content because there isn't a lot out there yet, which we'll talk more about, but um, that's kind of a little preview. So welcome everybody. And thank you, Jennifer, as well. Um, and she and Amanda will be telling us about their national early childhood education discipline group, which is really an exciting effort around bringing educators from around the country together to develop this content. 
And I also want to mention that uh, Matthew Bloom uh, is with me today. He's part of our executive council. He's in, at Scottsdale Community College, and he's helping with uh, coordinating the chat window. And of course, Quill West is here, uh, the president of CCCOER. Liz Yada, my um, support specialist, is here. And I'm sorry if more of my executive council are here. I, um, they can, they can uh, type it in the chat window. I, I can't scroll down now. We have over 50 people now uh, at our webinar, and we're so excited to have you join us. So um, I just for those of you who might be new to the Community College Consortium for OER, our, we are celebrating actually our 11th year. Our anniversary was last year for 10. And our mission remains very much the same as when we first started. Um, about expanding awareness and access to high quality OER, supporting faculty in this work as they develop it. And at the heart of all this is improving student success. Um, of course, many things have changed in the last 10 or 11 years. We've gone from individual faculty adoptions to full, um, full um, OER degree pathways or zero textbook cost uh, pathways, depending on your um, terminology. And um, of course, we're going to these statewide repositories as well, which uh, we're going to hear more about soon. I just wanted to mention our membership really quickly. CCCOER has 70 members in 30 states. And I just want to give a shout out to our brand new members who joined us this summer um, and into the fall. Uh, Central Carolina Community College, College of Southern Nevada, um, Heinz Community College in Mississippi and Fox Valley Technical College just joined us this week. So very excited to have them as members. Now, I wanted to just say a few words about uh, collaborative platforms before I turn this over to um, our experts in this area. Um, last, um, last June, we had a webinar on um, OER collaboration and um, and developing materials and we got some feedback um, after that webinar that you wanted to hear specifically about um, platforms from the people who were who were using these platforms and so that's what drove um, us reaching out to Peter and Donna to talk about the OER hub they're developing and also uh, Amanda and Jennifer who are using the Rebus community platform for developing their early childhood education uh, group. And in listening to them, you know, over the last week as we were reviewing what uh, their talk, um, these four things kind of came out uh, for me, and I, I think there's a lot of more nuances involved, but um, they're looking to provide a simplified search for OER um, with Jennifer and Amanda. Of course, it's specific for early childhood education, so providing a place for their faculty who are participating in this to go and find that materials easily um, and make it searchable by course ID and course outcomes and things like that. Um, a second one is collaborative authoring space. So a place where faculty and subject matter experts can collaborate on authoring together uh, the content. Um, another piece that I heard, um, particularly from Amanda and Jennifer, is about a publishing workflow. So how do you go from concept, learning outcome, you know, modules with uh, content in it to actually publishing something that can be reused um, and delivered to students? And finally, um, something I think that uh, perhaps Peter and Donna have, have talked a little bit more about is sharing the development costs around providing um, a shared resource like this and also the maintenance going forward. So it's, you know, there's the upfront development costs, but then maintaining uh, particularly hubs where you're um, curating materials, um, but also true in a discipline group. How do you continue uh, with that maintenance and having, um, a community of practice around that is very helpful. So it's not just one college um, or one faculty member who's responsible. So now I'd like to turn this over to Donna and Peter, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so they can start theirs. I'm not hearing you. Did, did you guys mute yourself by any chance, uh, Donna or Peter?
Can you hear us now? We can hear you now. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I, we, I went down to the screen and suddenly the unmute button disappeared. I'm just now looking to get to the screen sharing as well. So okay. I apologize. Take a second here. Um, no worries. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. When I, for some reason, the uh, the controls seem to seem to have vanished for a moment there. I'm trying to find them again, but um. Hmm. Okay. So, um, if you so, are, uh, did, they they should be either at the bottom or the. Yeah, top. I know they usually they were popping up before, and now all of a sudden the um, for some reason the uh, the control vanished. I apologize to everyone for this, but um. So. One of those classic. No, we may have to rejoin you. I'm so sorry. Well, you know, I, I um I do actually also have. Right. I Excellent. have. Um, have you found yours? Exit minimize video. I think yeah. I I think I found it. Thank you. This yeah, it got minimized for some reason. So let me go into the share. Okay. And uh, there we go. I think we go share now and. Excellent. I think we got it. Yeah, that's yeah, perfect. Excellent. Thanks everybody for your patience. No worries. So, any case, um, our little story about um, how we um, arrived at a uh, building of a shared OER hub with Community Colleges of Massachusetts. So, again, we did an introduction before. Um, Donna and I uh, were part of the Go Open um, Council here at um, the Community Colleges of Massachusetts. Um, part of collaboration of our 15 community colleges. It was an initiative that started um, two, two, years, two ago. years ago. And um, uh, it produced a, a very large body of um, OER materials as well as significant savings um, for the community colleges that participated. Donna, how much again did we do? So we, um, we were able to create over 800 items that we um, had. And of course, those were, this was part of a TAC grant from the Department of Labor. Um, those items were then um, uploaded into Skill Commons. But the members of the council, we very much wanted to have a, a, a repository that we were able to upload all our materials and where each community college would have its own imprint. Um, so the repository part of that project um, really came at, at the very conclusion of the TACT grant. Um, and we were fortunate in that it did because there was TACT money available to help fund the initial um, repository. Um, <clears throat> so this is just information about, um, this is really the origin of our hub was it, it came out of the MASCO open. Um, that initial funding um, is uh, allowed us to purchase um, and to contract with ISCME, which is OER Commons, and we're now just going through the design work and the initial uploads um, of some of those materials. And um, we're, we're getting administrators from each of the 15 community colleges to help us do that. Yes, and, uh, our, our promise has been tremendously supportive He's helped coordinate the communication with the other chief academic officers. And again, I think it's really been a priority in the state over the past two years um, to really build up our OER capacity. Um, thanks to the, the energy that was produced by Go Open, which was initially um, headed by Sue Tashin and Jody Carson of the Northern Essex Community College. I don't think we can say enough for the leadership that they've produced in this area. And it certainly helped accumulate in the development of the Northeast OER Summit, which we have every year at UMass Amherst. We had some conversations um, with Mindy. I know Mindy's in the audience. Jump in anytime, Mindy, um, as we talk about ISCME um, and OER Commons. But um, they were a very um, attractive platform for us. Um, they had many um, hubs that we could view and take a look at and see how this might work for the 15 community colleges here in the Commonwealth. Um, and it's, it's uh, really been a wonderful experience thus far. So um, when it, the way we selected OER Commons is that we did put out an RFP, um, and there are only two vendors that submitted proposals. 
Um, and it was essentially members from the OER Council, statewide council that reviewed those proposals um, and awarded it to OER Commons. So why did OER Commons succeed? Well, there are a number of things. One of which, of course, for community colleges is always the matter of cost. Um, we thought the price was eminently reasonable and um, about 11,000 to start um, the, the hub and about what, 1,500 to maintain it or yep. something in that, yes. that neighborhood. Um, again, in terms of pricing, it was right within the uh, area that we could afford um, and it certainly made it eminently interesting to the uh, chief academic officers who could see the, the way to help them fund it. There was also the fact that we had produced through Go Open so many resources that we really need a centralized place to put them. Obviously, um, they were they could be uh, located in Skills Commons and OER Commons. But one of the things that we typically hear from faculty is, when I go to existing OER repositories, I can I spend 20 minutes just trying to find very simple things. So we realized that um, it was a good idea for us to begin exploring creating our own statewide repository where we could really tag things and make it much easier for faculty to find them, because we really felt, apart from the production of OER materials, um, finding a way to facilitate the location and use of OER was one of our chief priorities. Um, and again, it, the, um, the agreement with OER Commons allowed not only for a shared hub, but for um, functions that allowed individual institutions also to create unique contributions. It's quite certain for um, the faculty that we have and for the hub administrators, the, the librarians that are going to be helping out um, to have tools that are easy to use to be able to complete the authoring process. Um, so we were very impressed by OER um, Commons um, contract, what, what they offered to us, and the fact that their authoring and curation tools were um, very accessible and could be, you know, could be used by our faculty as well as our you know, administrators and librarians. Yes. In my experience as an instructional designer, it's very important that um, when you're using um, uh, technology with faculty, given the, the range of um, a technical comfort there are among faculty, that you want the tools to be as simple and easy to use as possible. And I think the ones that, that, um, that were provided by um, ISME or OER Commons were, um, were quite easy to learn. So we're, we're actually in the midst of our training and support um, by our team over at ISCME. Um, so we've been meeting uh, weekly for the last several weeks um, and they've been very accessible um, and it's been a real, it's been a real wonderful process, very um, trouble free, they're very flexible. Um, and so that's been, that's been great. And once we do go live, we still have their support. Um, we will have their trainings that have been filmed so that we can make those available. Um, and we also have access to their help center um, for additional support. And I also think too, the fact that OER Commons is such, so, so much one of the better known repositories that that helps increase the confidence of the people um, who are gonna be working with the hub in the sense that it's being connected to a larger national um, uh, facility. So ISME also provides an analytics dashboard that will, you know, incorporate Google Um, Peter and um, Donna, we've, I think we've lost sound to you. I thought I was the one who was frozen, but I guess uh, they froze. Huh? <laughs> I think we had a little bit of a hiccup there. Um, I imagine Peter and Donna are going to be right back.
course, you know, none of this ever happens while you're rehearsing. <laughs> Everything works flawlessly. Okay, looks like we've got Tom. Everyone, sorry, someone at the computer decided to reboot, so I'm just going <laughs> to... The demo gods are against you, Peter. Probably a gas, probably something else is blowing up here. Um, I don't know if any of you heard about our gas. We thought maybe Columbia Gas decided to just blow us up in the middle of our presentation. Forgive us. So, um, so I'm just trying to do the screen sharing again now. It's why, let's see, do I... Um, so yeah, I click on share. And do you have your PowerPoint loaded? Sorry. Let's see. So it says you cannot, sh let's see. Um, there we go, let's share. And so let me, skip down to where I think we were, uh, data analytics and present. Yeah. Yeah, so. So loading and there we go. So I think we're back in the game now. Can you everybody hear us? Yep, we can hear you great. Great. Okay, great. So um, some of the challenges that we're facing is that each of us that um, are working on the repository all have at least another full-time job and responsibilities in addition um, to launching this repository. Um, and we've got a core team, Sue Tashian from Northern Essex, as Peter mentioned, and Jody Carson. We've got a really great core team, but the fact of the matter is it's a challenge on a weekly basis to make sure that we're keeping up with what we need to do. And I think as we involve more administrators, group administrators from other community colleges, and we get a little bit of a rhythm going, I think we're going to be doing just fine, but I think it's a challenge for, for any um, collaborative cross-institutional group. It's been really the build year for us. We're kind of like, um, we're figuring out as we go along, um, and uh, by the end of the year, I think we'll be much wiser about how this process should undergo. But again, I think I'm very, I'm very confident that we have a lot of momentum. Um, we have so many great colleagues, our community colleges here in Massachusetts who want to um, go forward with this work, and they all, very excited when um, the hub was launched. In fact, I got an email this morning, basically with, from one colleague from one of our major community colleges going, when can I start? So I think apart from the occasional glitches, like the one we saw a few minutes ago, um, I think we have a lot of momentum. Uh, but as Donna said, we're all of us pretty much are adding this on top of our existing full-time jobs. And many of us, like those of you in all the community colleges already have pretty full plates. So things like tagging and adding meta metadata is going to be one of the challenges going forward. It's such a crucial part of doing any OER work, but it is time consuming. So we're trying to figure out now just how much time we need to allocate to the activity. How much of the activity um, can we ask of faculty who are creating the OER material? Um, so that for us is still pretty much a question mark, but we're hopeful the next few months we'll be able to have, we all offer um, a reasonably good answer to that. At the time we were putting together this presentation, um, we were noting that in the Commonwealth, now that the TAC grant is, is completed, um, there really is no overarching funding, statewide initiative or funding um, for OER de development in Massachusetts. Each individual community college has to fund its own um, development and means to share their OER uh, resources with other institutions. Um, we were very fortunate that our, as Peter mentioned, our chief academic officers uh, rallied the troops of other um, academic officers. And so the agreement was TACT would pay for the initial um, cost of the repository. And then on a yearly basis, the community colleges will split that fee. We are really excited because there's been, um, skipping around here, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. We are really excited because um, another grant was just funded and uh, the name of that grant, which is a successor to Mass Go Open, is the Mass OER Collaborative. Um, and that 
funding, which I think at least $75,000, it hasn't exactly been announced officially, $75,000 in additional money for stipends for faculty across the Commonwealth. Um, and the fact that we ha are building this repository in conjunction with the collaborative grant, um, I think is, is really wonderful that we can say to faculty, here's this repository that we're building um, so that your materials can be uploaded directly into that, um, I think is really great. So, and we're building capacity for OER across the public higher education system in the Commonwealth. That's super great. An exciting time for us and Massachusetts to be involved in OER. Um, so uh, again, uh, uh, many of you are in, in community college systems that are already pretty well integrated with one another. Um, the Massachusetts community colleges have uh, existed pretty independently of each other um, for many years, but now owing to planning enrollments, there's a lot of competitions around how we can collaborate and share resources. So the OER provides an opportunity for modeling collaborative activities that could probably be applied to other non-OER activities between the community colleges. So that's something that we can make a unique contribution as the colleges go forward. Um, again, the hub is gonna be a great opportunity for us to really scale up our work and I model ourselves on the great work that's been done by other states in this area, for example, Open Oregon. Um, so one of the questions we ask is, uh, like, um, how do you sustain it? Um, I know that from uh, the experiences of other states, it's often uneven how much OER momentum you can carry forward depending upon a variety of conditions. And again, I think um, we're optimistic, but we're, we're cautiously optimistic because we know that our faculty are incredibly busy people they're concerned about OER and they're concerned about the cost of education for their students, but they're also involved in, they're also asked on a routine basis to do many, many things. So um, again, we'll be observing um, the creation and adoption over the next uh, couple of years, but certainly this latest grant is a, certainly a great um, boost, but, yeah, but that provides money. The other thing that I hear from faculty is, I'm glad you have the money, but now you need to find a way to give me the time as well. So in my own case, I find that funding OER work during the summertime is a good idea. As the Director of Professional Development, I have access to regular mini-grant funds and a certain degree of that proportion just for the creation of OER. So I have found thus far that um, during the regular year, the summertime is really the um, best time to um, have faculty work on OER projects, which means, of course, that the conversation around the development of OER work should begin sometime in the spring. All right. All right. So I, we really think that this hub is going to be a great, um, a, a great value to hopefully not just the Commonwealth, but for um, institutions outside of the Commonwealth. Um, I've come to rely on some of these um, other statewide initiatives, such as Open Oregon and, and Open Washington and Georgia. Um, the list goes on. So um, we hope that we can contribute uh, as well through this, this great hub that we're putting together. Yeah, I think there's a certain degree of embarrassment too at the state level because Massachusetts always prides itself, as you probably have heard, on being the quote unquote education state. Um, OER um, work, uh, apart from the work that was done um, 15 years ago by um, MIT in terms of open course, where we really haven't been out in the front of OER work, I think, since then. And we've been watching um, with a certain degree of envy of what the other states have been doing. So now is our opportunity to really um, play catch up and make a unique contribution. All right, well, thank you so much, Peter and Donna. Um, and I want to open this up for a couple of questions. We're running just a tad over, but um, okay. <laughs> you did have a question here in the chat window from Jennifer Alvarado. And I'm wondering if Jennifer is in Massachusetts, but she asks, when will your hub be available, Peter and Donna? So there's going to be a soft open at the end of the month. We'll certainly um, make people aware that uh, when we do um, actually have it go live for people outside of <laughs> our small group. Um, we've got a bit more work to do. The design work is going well, but we have a bit more work to do before we can get some content up and into the repository for people to view. Opening a hub is kind of like opening a restaurant. <laughs> um, you, you, everyone's expecting it, everyone's looking forward to it, you're looking forward to it, everyone's excited. And then there's certain things that happen that say, well, we, we'd love to do the, the ribbon cutting on the state, but the actual food will be served at a later date. So that's, that's kind of where we're at. Okay. Um, 
any other questions now for Peter and Donna? We'll also come back to them at the end. And um, okay, we'll take one more question here from Carrie Gitz at Austin. She says, did OER Commons provide training and development for you and faculty? So yeah, so we've been having weekly uh, meetings um, where we're getting some of that training. And forgive me I, if I'm, I hope I heard the question correctly. Yeah, so we've been getting great support from, from OER Commons. And all the trainings that we um, participate in are being recorded so that we can then share them with our uh, group administrators as well. So yeah, the support's been wonderful. Okay, and thank you, Donna. And I just think, um, to be clear that um, OER Commons is um, it's a project of ISKME. So there, I'm not sure if there's a little... Con if, That's if right. We should, we should be confused. ISKME is the organization that is providing us the tools to build our hub. And their, their major project, of course, is OER Commons, in which the hub would be um, a part of. So that, that, yeah, that's a point that we should clarify. Yes, people call us OER Commons all the time. So... <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mindy. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we are going to move on to our next presenter. Um, and so let's see, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing now, uh, Donna and Peter. Thank you. And um, next up, of course, is Jennifer Paris and Amanda Tainter. Um, and they're going to talk about their national early childhood education discipline groups. I'm going to stop sharing so that um, you can start, Amanda and uh, Jennifer. Okay, there she goes. You're still muted, Amanda, just so you know. All right, sorry, right. I think I was sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> Here we go. There you go. Okay. All right, so Jennifer and I are going to be talking about um, the Early Childhood Education Discipline Group, and we're just going to briefly go over some of the background about how it came about, where we are now, and where we're going. Uh, if you haven't met me before, I'm a talker, and I promised Una to stay to 15 minutes, but I can't cut content out, so how I adapt is I just talk faster. So the screen, the slides are available, and I apologize if I freight train through it, but I have a hard time leaving out important stuff, so I acknowledge in advance that it's going to go fast. Um, so our, our why. For me, the why was about two years ago, I stumbled on OER and I thought, oh, this is a great idea. So I applied for one of the local grants, um, AB 798. I thought, I'm in early childhood. We can do this. So we applied and got it and thought, you know, I've seen OpenStax. I've seen all of this other information that's out there and available. I can just pull from that. Um, I soon discovered I can't. Uh, early childhood has little to no information out there. So that was the moment of discovery of this is a field that desperately needs open education content for our students, and yet we, we have little to nothing out there. When I say little to nothing, I mean little to nothing. Um, our students graduate and still make minimum wage, and yet we're saddling them with $100, $200 textbooks in each of our courses. So it was the moment of discovery that we need to do something. And in the process of, of reaching out and figuring it out, um, I met Jennifer. Um, so Jennifer, I don't know if you want to share really quick your, your moment. Sure, yeah. So um, one of the colleges that I came from as adjunct before I was here at College of the Canyons is Miracosta. And they were doing some work with some ZT grants. Um, and I kind of was leaving as they were starting, but they let me come back and peer review. And what we found is that, um, or what I found as a peer reviewer, so kind of in the student mode at that point, was that um, kind of the, the go-to model out there is to just kind of link to a lot of different resources because there really isn't anything where it's already compiled. And it doesn't necessarily lead for an ideal educational system. So that was kind of my moment where it's like, we got to do something about this. We got to to get some good quality OER out there um, so that people have something to start with. Mm -hmm. Um, so as Jennifer and I started to, to collaborate and, and see, okay, what can we do to find this OER work, we started to talk to other early childhood professionals who were also discovering the same thing that we had figured out and starting to do work on their own. And it just became this burden of why are we all who are already overworked continuing to replicate the work and replicate the work and replicate the work? We need to get together and leverage all of these resources and all of these hours of work that the ECE um, early childhood educators are putting in. Um, in California, we have 
about 10 years ago, we started what was called the Curriculum Alignment Project CAP. And within that, we most of the, the 114 community colleges came together and figured out which core eight courses would be aligned across our colleges. So our student learning outcomes, um, the, the basic core of them matched, our outlines matched. Um, and if you've ever been in a room with academics, for them to agree on eight courses was mind boggling. Um, child development, if you're not familiar with it, we can have 20 to 30 on up different courses in each department. So some of you might be thinking eight, that's not hard. When you have 30 courses in a department, whittling down to the eight you find is the primary, what was an act. So we have these eight core courses across California that are aligned with one another. And so that became our focus as we form these discipline groups. But then we realized it's not just California centric. We've identified these eight in California because the base Basics are the basics. Even though we have 20, 30, 40 classes, the basics of working with young children are still there and covered in these eight core courses. And that's why the, the curriculum alignment project did choose them. So we knew that that putting these discipline together, a group together, was not just going to be a California thing, but across the nation, we have these same courses and concepts that developing OER resources for would be highly beneficial. So the how. So we're going to go briefly through, um, briefly, uh, what are the things that we've done with these discipline groups so far? Yeah, so um, Amanda, we met, we discovered, so we all applied for the ZTT grant. For those of you outside of California, essentially our um, chancellor's office um, had these grants for um, different schools to use to develop OER and we discovered there's about five of us working on ECE and we didn't know when we applied that anybody else was doing this and so we were in the same room and Amanda dropped this and I'd really love to have an ECE OER summit and I thought about it for a while and then I reached I said do you mind if I run with that and so back in March we hosted the first ECE um, summit um, initially with our registrations we had almost 40 community colleges in the state represented uh, two different CSU some different statewide organizations um, had a little bit less actually participate than that um, she decided to host a follow-up in June up in Reedley we had a much smaller number um, of uh, participants but definitely some passion in the room there um, and then on Friday we're um, hosting part three so in part one we looked at um, harnessing the work to have everybody uh, find content so go out and find content that people can use. Um, and some of the groups did an amazing job. Um, I, I had somebody at one of my work groups that actually left saying, wow, I think I have enough to go OER next semester. And that was pretty powerful because, you know, there isn't anything out there that's compiled. So um, our goal now is to actually move into kind of writing. And so that's part three we'll be working on. Um, actually curating content. Um, and so uh, we're excited about that. I'm still trying to figure out all those details. I'm scrambling, but um, we're super excited. Um, and from our ECE summits, we started to gather this ongoing listserv. We had people that had registered for the list for, for the summits, and then people who had reached out to colleagues and say, hey, you should come to the summit, and oh, I can't go. Can I be part of the listserv? And so it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And it's become this good communication hub. Uh, we have over 140 participants and, and literally it grows every day. Someone emails Jennifer or I and said, hey, can I be part of this listserv? Um, and, and so as we simply add them and it's become a simple way, low tech, we just throw it on a shared Google Doc for Jennifer and I. And then when we send out communication, we simply cut and paste those emails. So again, it's a very simple low tech way that we've found to just communicate with one another um, and Jennifer's going to go into some of the more complex ways that we're, we're communicating and um, curating some material. Oh, I'm going to talk about it next. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that we decided was, and, and the previous group had mentioned it, is keeping OER in the front of everybody's mind. We're so bogged down with other items. And so at the end of last semester, we decided, all right, so let's just jump in and start um, having these ECEOE OER conversations on the second and fourth Wednesday. Uh, we're all busy, but if we just put it on the calendar, have it set second and fourth Wednesday, noon to one, people can eat their lunch. And the purpose of it is to simply chat about what they found, what they've discovered, um, what they've heard about different ECE OER uh, materials or who's working on them. 
we're rotating slowly through the eight core courses and then expand after that. So it allows us to focus on one of those courses and say, all right, did you find anything about this course? Please share with us who's working on it. Um, and it is what the name implies, a simple conversation. Um, I always say, and Jennifer says, I'm not, you know, I'm just facilitating this. I'm supporting. This is your time. Let's talk about what you're doing. It also allows us to touch base. All right, do you have a better suggestion? How can we move this forward? What are some additional ways we can grow this ECE OER conversation? So yeah, I know we're running out of time, so I will speed up. So even before we got the grant, um, when I was working with Miracosta, I realized we needed some sort of place. And so I was trying to think of what might work, created a Google group, which has thankfully taken off um, with time. Um, and essentially what I did is I went in and I created a thread for all of the classes that I could think of. And as Amanda said, we've got 20 to 30 different classes. Um, I went in and I found any cap outlines that I could that would kind of give us a, a focus. At that first summit, we use those outlines to find uh, sources of content that are either free or open. Um, we kind of went both ways because we knew some people would just be going zero, zero cost and not OER. Um, and so that's what happened. Um, and then if you want to go to the next slide, Amanda, um, that uh, you can see conversations happening about specific content. So when we post something, someone replies, and so we kind of have this back and forth about different uh, possible um, content to be used. And um, it's, been, it's been a nice um, free, I think that was important to us, um, and not behind any um, walls at any specific colleges. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving forward. So we've, we've grown this great community and we have all these early childhood professionals that are sitting at the precipice of, all right, we're collaborating, we're communicating. Now we need to start moving forward and actually writing some of this OER content. We've gathered some of the sources that are out there. And that's when Rebus came along uh, alongside of us. And, and I just, I cannot speak highly enough about their, their patience with as we're putting this together and, and their support on us. Um, and so through the converse with us uh, and through the conversations, um, it's like, we really want to do all of this, 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 these, these eight books, let's launch them out. Um, and they provided some great guidance and said, how about we start with two, work out all the bugs, and then we'll go to the other six. And so that's what we've done is, is now we're starting and we focused on two um, books, Principles and Practices, Health, Safety, and Nutrition. And then as we work out all those bugs, we can rapid fire those out. Um, and so we're compiling those outlines and then going to go out for a call for authors. And so we're, we're tag teaming with the summit that Jennifer had mentioned on Friday. So people can, EC professionals can start getting their feet wet and, and, and writing um, and say, hey, I can do this. And then with that, we're going to partner um, and say, hey, we're actually starting to write the book. Would you like to, to be an author? Um, and so Rebus has really been there and, and guided us through the process of creating the leadership team for these books, defining what the project is, because both Jennifer and I, and if you've ever worked with ECE people, we're kind of, this is so exciting. We're going to do this. And we need people to say, all right, let's, let's define what's the scope. Um, you know, what does this mean? What does your team look like? And so they, Rebus has really helped walk us through that process of defining what the project is. What is the timeline we're hoping to accomplish? Um, what is the outline? And now going to recruiting authors. We have this community around us um, and then the guides that they've created to, to, to guide through the process of you have a team. What are some of the parts of the team? What are the benefits of having a large team and a small team and lots of authors and smaller authors? Um, and then going out to the editing process and what that's going to look like and the process of that. All right, I did it. Whew, you guys hung in there. All right, all right. That, that's your last slide. That's it. Sorry. Yes, that was abrupt ending, but I looked at the time and I said, I want to make sure and finish on time. <laughs> oh, no worries. You, we actually stole a little time from you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and let's see, there was a couple of questions in the chat window. Um, yes, so uh, one was on accessibility, um, and that came from the uh, one of the other Jennifers. I'm not sure if there are more than two of us here. Um, so we are blessed at College of the Canyons. We actually have OER staff. Um, so with the funding that um, we have been, not me, the bigger we, um, has been able to um, get from the different grant sources and that kind of stuff, uh, we actually have hourly staff that um, I'm really lucky that they can do a lot of that accessibility formatting. Um, and so I'm using my resources as much as possible. So I'm kind of collecting the collaboration and then we'll use, um, I apologize if you can hear that. I'm in the children's center and they're, there's some loud things going on in the hallway um, <laughs> um, that uh, they'll help with the accessibility, all of the formatting um, and uh, really put it into the finished process. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that, um, as Zoe's saying in the chat window, that Rebus is also going to make sure that anything work that's done. And so we actually kind of have two things going simultaneously um, because our grant period is short. Um, so we're kind of trying to zoom through the grant, but also back it up with some more sustainable um, efforts through Rebus. Um, and so uh, we're kind of trying to figure out how to navigate all of that. And, and, and Zoe answered the question, but that's what I was going to chime in and say is, is um, Rebus accessibility is on the forefront of all of the guides and everything they're doing is making sure that what we're creating is accessible as we're doing it and even recommending having an accessibility person um, expert. I, I apologize, Zoe, I can't remember the name, uh, but, but that is their primary responsibility in writing these books is to have an eye out for accessibility. Um, and then Christopher had one for a collaborative authoring then using which editors. That's one of the things in the process of working with Rebus is figuring out who is going to be the editors for, for each of these books and building that team um, for each of the individual eight books that we're, we're going through. And yeah, and we'll probably be reaching back out to the wider collaborative to try and find people that are interested in helping us make these resources as amazing as they can be. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Zoe answered um, Christopher's question. Yeah, and um, interesting that uh, Zoe said that uh, Rebus does have an accessibility work group, but it's on hiatus right now. Uh, did, I, did I miss any other questions that were up there? Um, yeah, um, you know, they were, Christopher was asking about collaborative authoring um, and uh, which editors you're using. And I think, um, as you as you said earlier, you're using Google Docs uh, as the editor for uh, this stage of the process. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. So that's where we're using to just throw in information. And then we're going to be moving over. Um, Zoe uses, oh, Zoe, <laughs> Rebus uses Pressbooks. And so that's where, where when we move to that, like we're in the beginning stages. So it's all in the infancy, but that's what we'll be using to put everything together um, when we're, in that stage. Yep, so kind of the informal work that we're doing at the summits has been through Google Docs and Google Sheets just because it's kind of free and not behind any institution's uh, walls, um, virtual walls. Um, but yes, once we have content, then we will move it into Rebus with Pressbooks um, uh, somehow. We're, we're still figuring <laughs> all of this out. We are, mm -hmm. but we're jumping on everybody that's interested. We're going to try and keep people that have expressed interest. So we're just, we're running. <laughs> Um, so Zoe mentioned that they, she has some Google Docs on the early stages of collaborating on content. Can you share some of that, Zoe? Is that, do you have links to those that <clears throat> you could share with folks who might be looking at collaborating on content? Okay, wonderful. Um, you can either share it in the chat window or um, we can Sorry. send it out with the slides. I might just jump in, uh, my typing is not quite catching up with my thought processes. Um, the absolutely was to, uh, to what Jennifer and Amanda are saying. Um, so we, we use Google Docs for, for the content that we're working on with our books. We do also have documentation in progress. Right now we're trialing that with, um, with a set of projects, uh, including Jennifer and Amanda's, uh, and that we will be releasing soon. And as soon as it is, we'll be we'll be sending it out over the listservs and whatnot, and we'll make that available to people. So it's it's not quite ready to to go out wider. We're running it with real life projects to make sure it's kind of effective, um, and then we'll be coming down the pipeline as soon as possible. Okay, <laughs> thanks for the clarification on that one. Mm. <clears throat> All right, I am um, going to go ahead and ask you to stop sharing just for okay. a minute, and we'll come back to Q&A. I just want to go through our final slides here, um, and um, I wanted to mention another project, uh, which is Dave Braunschweig. Oops, I'm, you know, I misspelled his name, but uh, Dave is running a computer information, well, he's a computer information systems faculty at Harper College, and I noticed that we have somebody else here from Harper today. And Dave is running a programming fundamentals community group on Rebus. And um, he couldn't join us today because he's teaching at this time. But I, I asked him if he wanted me to share some information about that. So if we have any computer science teachers out there, um, or if some of you work with uh, computer science faculty, you might share this uh, 
this community uh, with them. Uh, Dave has finished the first seven chapters of this Programming Fundamentals textbook and would love your feedback on it. And all the links are here and um, these slides will be available later um, if, you, if you can't copy that down quickly enough, but it's fairly easy. It's press.rebus.community and then slash Programming Fundamentals. So there, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of other community uh, groups getting started as well, um, some on Rebus, some on other platforms. Um, just wanted to mention, we hope to see many of you at the Open Ed Conference, which is um, coming up in just a few weeks, I think about three weeks in the middle of October. We also keep a list of all the open education or all the conferences, I would say, that have an open education theme or focus under our Get Involved. And I want to say thanks to Kiri Dolly, the uh, amazing digital OER librarian at Lord Fairfax Community College, and who's on our executive council, and she helps us maintain that list. Um, and also, if you're not on our community email, you can go to our website under community email and join us. Uh, we will have another webinar um, in October, on October 17th, on different approaches to sustainable open education. And we'll get that announcement out to you in uh, the next week or so and let you know uh, who our speakers are. And uh, the registration is available um, already on our website under fall webinars. All right, back to questions for um, both Amanda and Jennifer and also for um, Peter and Donna. Um, it, one, one question that came up earlier was about collaborative authoring tools. And I know that um, Peter and Donna have collaborative authoring tools as part of um, the collaborative platform they're using. And I wondered if they wanted to speak to that. Um, yeah, you guys, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we're just beginning to, to use the tools um, available through um, ISME's um, um, OER Commons um, platform tools. For Go Open, we used um, a lot, we made great use of Google Docs. Um, it was something that um, people could uh, share out with, and um, it, was, uh, it was, again, technology that many faculty were already um, familiar with. So uh, in terms of the tools that we're using for materials, it's, it's pretty basic, um, commonly used technology. Uh, again, we're using some of the um, uh, tool building uh, facilities in, um, in OER Commons, but we're at the very beginning, so I really can't speak to in any great detail in terms of um, its use, although I find that the interface is very simple, which again is something that it's, it's very important for our kind of activity. Other than that, um, uh, some of the uh, tools available that I, that I recommended to people um, um, particularly if they're doing interactive material, is HP5 is an open source tool that um, people are interested in if they're doing um, interactive open educational resources. But again, we like to keep the tools as simple as possible so, so it's focused on the content development. Um, somebody had a question about accessibility um, early on. Um, so we are, again, uh, you know, we, we're still figuring out the best way in which um, we can ensure the accessibility which obviously to us as to everyone else is very, very important. Um, so far it hasn't been an issue because again, we've been using very um, basic tools like Google Docs, um, which has made accessibility um, easy to uh, manage by and large. But again, it's one of those issues that I wish I could give you um, a, a good clear answer in terms of how we're going forward with it, but we're still resolving it ourselves. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, and Matthew uh, has, has let me know that uh, um, we're getting a little bit of feedback. So if uh, some people may need to mute themselves, so check your microphone. We had a question uh, from um, Fox Valley Technical College um, was asking about checklists that faculty might use to ensure that published OER is easy and consistent. And I wonder if um, either of our teams have checklists for, it sounds like almost evaluating the OER um, kind of like a peer review, but maybe a simplified one. And do either of your teams have that? We don't have anything like that, but if anybody does, please send it my way because I would probably use it. 
Um, the all, one of the processes we have on the Google Docs is if someone has any notations about licensing. So it's not necessarily the, the quality of the OER, um, but what we found um, in early childhood, and I'm sure this is across the board, is sometimes understanding the um, what people are using for fair use or even public domain or what you know is created uh, governmentally. Um, so we've just we've tried to put some clarifying comments if someone posts a, a resource in our Google group to say, hey, this is licensed, you know, however, so make sure you use it in here. Process to go through that. Um, it's informal, but that's one of the ways we've been using the, the Google Docs. And I would add here that um, emphasizing um, the uh, licensing of ROER has been one of the things that we've emphasized a lot, um, starting with Gove, and, and Donna has been one of the leaders in that area in terms of when we work with faculty, providing them very clear and thorough training as to um, fair use and Creative Commons licensing. Great, uh, th thank you all for that. And um, Quill had a great uh, suggestion. Uh, Quill, do you wanna speak up or shall I read that out to folks? Um, she put that in the chat window, but it, she said she would encourage faculty to come up with their own re review criteria. Um, and that can be a very effective way for a team of faculty. Um, and it's a great learning experience. All righty. Let's see. Yes, and, and thank you, Jenny, for sharing. There are um, a number of OER evaluation criteria rubrics out there. All of the repositories um, have uh, rubrics uh, from OER Commons, Merlot, um, the Open Textbook Library, BC Campus Open Textbook. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Matthew. Um, right, so those are, those are um, there are some really great and and somewhat more comprehensive checklists um, as well. And there's a question in there um, from Christopher asking about anyone, and I'm not even sure how you say the name of it, but Sigil, Sigil, I, I hadn't heard of it, but I don't know if any of you more seasoned people may have. Let me see. Um, I do not know that actually. Um, yes. Um, Christopher, do you want to speak up or get, give us more information on uh, what you're asking about? Um, yeah, thank you, Zoe, for mentioning that. Um, the BC campus does have a wonderful rubric, and they were definitely one of the early ones to come out with an open textbook rubric, and they had based it on previous repository rubrics, but they really brought it to a to a, um, I think a really usable level. Ah, so thank you, Christopher. That's a free application for authoring eBooks. Yes, Sailor, uh, they got it from Sailor and they actually got it from an old project that CCCOER used to work on as well, which was called the um, College Open Textbooks Project, but I'm dating myself now. That's um, quite old. <laughs> ah, all right, well, um, do we have any more questions? Anyone want to speak up? Uh, we're, so we still have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, do I, yeah, I'd like to add one thing. Um, apart from um, the compiling of, of OER materials and creating new ones, um, it's important that whenever I think you're beginning a new hub or repository is to figure out what kind of active roles students can have in, in, in both the management creating of it. Again, our, our default habits, I think, are rely on ourselves, faculty, and staff. But I think it's part of the whole open pedagogy approach that I'm um, thinking um, from the very beginning, what is the role of students as participants in the OER activity should be? And so that's one thing I would I recommend to everyone to uh, think about at their home institution. Yeah, and I know Una and we had, when we were rehearsing, we, we talked about kind of um, an implementation phase where we actually use it with students and get feedback as part of the cre more of the creation process, um, kind of moving that phase into kind of the creation process. And I think that's kind of what we're aiming for with our short timeline of the grant anyways, um, that our final products aren't going to be perfect um, uh, by any means, but that we can use the students to make them better um, and to make them involved in that process. Um, but yeah, I think maybe even better to do that um, in the process of creation if possible. But yeah, I. I Great point. Yeah, thank you both for sharing that. And as you know, we did have a great webinar on this back in 
it was either April or May of uh, last year on, and maybe someone can post that in the, um, in the chat window, uh, we had a student speak actually, who's one of the workers, um, and it turns out it's at Jennifer's campus, um, College of the Canyons. And they actually help with the formatting of the books, and they also help with finding resources, um, open images to support the faculty who are developing content. So wonderful idea. Um, students really appreciate what other students um, will be successful with. So the feedback you get from students when you're developing content can really be invaluable. I think another point is that many of us are involved in the OER work. Um, our conception of an educational resource was pretty much formed in the early 20th. It was formed in the um, late 20th century or the early 21st century. So we're not always mindful about how um, educational resources that are open um, uh, should be adapted to the more mobile um, platforms. And I think the student feedback in that point is essential. I think going forward, one of the questions we should ask ourselves when we're, when we're creating um, or even archiving all our resources is how accessible is this on a mobile device? Because many of our students, um, if they're going to invest in any kind of digital technology, it's, it's probably going to be um, a phone. Um, and that there's certainly times when we want them to be using um, larger computer technology like tablets and, and laptops, but many of them, the phone is becoming the default educational device. That being the case, what is our strategy going forward? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, with that comment, we're going to sign off, but I want to say thank you very much to all of our speakers, Jennifer, Amanda, Donna, and Peter, and thank you all for coming and for your great questions and staying involved in uh, this really important topic. Um, and we'll see you soon, either in person or at our next webinar.